Greetings and welcome to Mount Olympus. I am Hercules Invictus, and today on Age of Heroes, I bring you the Enchanted Self and Gateways to Enchantment with Dr. Barbara Becker Holstein, who is, who was, and always will be my enchantress. Greetings and welcome, Dr. Barbara Becker Holstein. Greetings to you too, too Hercules, and you will Thank always you. be one of the very special men in my life that uh, has intrigued me and and really been a very, very dear friend in the sense of an inspiring friend, which that's an unusual combination. You don't often get friends that really um, tip the well of information and inspiration and make you feel like you really have something tremendous to offer to the world. It's a really good capacity that you have and you share with many people. And tonight, I want to share a little bit back with you and myself. First of all, I want to talk about what I call the enchanted self and share with the public, but I hope we'll have some conversation. Um, got an allergy eye going on here, um, around some of these concepts, because I have found that even though this book I wrote, oops, oh, we, we made it all fuzzy. There it is clear a little bit. The Enchanted Self, A Positive Therapy, even though every word in this book is mine, you know, I didn't reframe anything from other people. I did have an editor that, of course, proofread it and changed some of the sentence patterns, things like that. But it came from me and those people like you that I had a chance to talk and process with as I developed. And yet now, eight, 17, 18 years later, I realize that I myself was not fed as much um, as I thought I was in the beginning. That understanding some of the dilemmas we're born into and that we have to handle, they're so serious that it's hard to make progress. And yet the enchanted self, as I reread my own preface, can really help us get to an elevated state of living. So I wanted to um, go through some of the preface, I'm not going to read it, I'm more going to talk it. Mm -hmm. Why as a psychologist did I get involved with the enchanted self? And the most simple reason I got involved was that I, came to understand that there was a serious mistake in mental health care in this country and probably in the world. And that was particularly evident, not so much if you go in with a pain in your abdomen, because it may not be particularly relevant that uh, you play bridge once a week if you have a pain in your abdomen. Uh, it's more important for the doctor to feel your stomach and perhaps take an x-ray and things like that. But when we go for mental health care, very often what we really need the mental health person to help us with is getting in touch with our own talents and habits and um potential and the inner side of us, the, the feelings that give us pleasure and the feelings that really harm us, that we don't even want to go near those feelings. And if we waste all our time or the therapist wastes all their time with, uh -huh, uh -huh, I see you have a problem in this area and that area, you know, it's not really helpful beyond a certain point because the 
what is wrong with us is very often deeply embedded in um, problems that happen, say, in early childhood or trauma we had. The stuff that is a pain in the neck that you know gets us uh, perhaps repeating certain moods or anxiety or depression, depressive tendencies, they go way, way back. And I question that it's not always necessary to, um, to clear them up unless they're really interacting with you in the present. Very often they are just lost in the closet of life. And if we can find enough of the things that give us strength and make us feel capable in the world and make us feel joyful at times and that we have something to give others, then we can sort of bring on the band, bring on the orchestra, the next time, next time. We're not starting from nothing. We're starting oh, yeah. from all sorts of early impressions. As I said, some of them may have had some damage attached to them, say if your parents were fighting a lot, but there probably were for most people, hundreds of good impressions, a certain smell when your grandmother cooked uh, the particular dish you loved that she made when you came over, the feelings you got when there was some snow on the ground as a little kid, the um, happiness you felt playing with a best friend when you were seven, on and on and on. Most people have had many, many good experiences. So I felt that psychologists, social workers, uh, we should all make an effort when we're working with our clients to ask enough questions and be interested enough to see what are their talents and potential and how can we help them release these things. So that ties into exactly what the enchanted self is. It is a way of getting to the parts of ourselves that make us joyful and happy and feeling good inside again and again, not just once. So let me just stop right here and see what your reactions are. I, I agree with you. I When I worked as a therapist in uh, various uh, city hospitals and uh, nonprofit uh, organizations, um, I always uh, felt that the, the focus on dysfunction is part of what kept somebody stuck in dysfunction because it became, they were trained whenever they saw a mental health professional to talk about what's not going right. When in actuality, there, there are things going wrong, things that go wrong, you know, like repeatedly and predictably, but there, there are things going right as well. But those weren't the types of things that people were uh, talking about. And I knew by virtue of being a Greek, that even though the ancient Greeks said panmetrion ariston, which means my, in all things balance or in all things moderation, uh, the heroes in the Greek stories and the heroines in the Greek stories, they had one talent that they cultivated and developed, creating an imbalance. And that imbalance was a key to who they were and what they were all about. And all of us have that as well. We have unique creative self-expression and although you can generalize it into archetypes or stereotypes, it still says something uniquely about us in our environment. And I'm thinking of uh, the show we started out on, Uniquely You Now. May knew yes. that and may uh, put it uh, out there. Uh, so I always try to, uh, in addition to allowing people to speak about the things that bothered them and, and the things that happened and what they could have done you know, differently and uh, offering like insights on that as an outsider who wasn't in their situation, uh, I would try to get them to talk about their interests and what went right and what uh, um, they enjoyed and the, the happy things that happened too. And what would often happen is over time, uh, the realization would come that 
uh, even though you're not really in control of what happens to you, what you choose to dwell on is very largely in your control, as is how you interpret what happens uh, to you. That's very much in your control as well. So people felt, uh, you know, powerful. And, and also the realization that although we feel alone when we're going through difficulty, we never are really alone because these things are part of the human condition. And there are songs written about what we're going through. There are uh, movies, TV shows, and books written where, where the characters, where the heroes are going through the same type of things uh, that we're going through. And if we read literature, these things have been going on with people since the dawn of time, or at least since we've been able to write. So yeah. that joins us to the entire human race, and we're not you know, truly alone. So even if a person didn't have a therapist to come and see and talk to uh, someone who will listen and be sympathetic and uh, insightful, um, the, the very fact that in our popular culture, all of these things are echoed over and over and over again, uh, you're one with humanity, you're part of the human condition. And you're one with God, at least in many of uh, many religions. Yes. And uh, there was an interesting quote I came across, um, which is out of um, the Jewish religion. Uh, it's a silent prayer, actually. Thank you, God, for letting me be born with my uniqueness and special gifts because if there had already been someone exactly like me, I would not need to have been born. That's beautiful. That is very beautiful and very insightful too. And I, I think that uh, there's a lot of truth in that, that everybody has just a slightly different uh, snowflake, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, um, so, uh, I want to, I'm jumping around. I always think I'm going to do something straight linear. And once I get with you, that never happens. But um, <laughs> what happened a month or so ago, and I don't think I brought it up in my last, uh, our last conversation because I had gotten COVID and we missed one, um, is I opened, I think I, maybe I did say that I opened this bookcase and some writings fell out that I had done in college. Yes, I believe you shared okay. that. So I've been thinking a lot about these seven pages. And um, the interesting thing is that if they had never fallen out, I would never have gone back to consider perhaps writing a novel or a long story or something around uh, Barnard in, in the early days of um, changes happening like um, flower children and drugs and all sorts of things. I, it wouldn't have even come to me. But I'm thinking now that for uh, so many people who have been stunned uh, by this whole thing of um, abortion changes after we had settled in for many years. And when, I'm not saying everything was done wisely or correctly, but certainly on the right track of giving people the uh, rights to their own decisions. Yes. Um, I began to think that it might be very interesting for those millions and millions of women who were who are still alive, alive and kicking, traveling, playing golf, writing books, being movie stars from those, that period of time, which was a very raucous period of time where there still were backroom uh, abortions all the time and where we uh, witnessed a young president get shot down and, you know, a lot of things. Um, but also these same millions of women have assumed for many, many years now that their daughters and granddaughters would never have to make decisions where, or have decisions made for them around certain human rights. And maybe there's more there. Maybe, you know, maybe there was a reason those pages fell out. I'm not certain and I'm not sure I'm really up, you know, I'm up to the full investment of 
you know, like a 180 page book. I've been there. I've done that. Mm -hmm. And you live it. You live it till it's done. Yes. You know? But I'm not sure I'm not there, you know. So these interesting things that happen to us in life, often we don't know why they happen, as you said, and sometimes negative things happen, but sometimes positive things happen to edge us on. And um, I think that with the enchanted self, we're, if we look for it, we're always being edged on. And I'll just tell you a couple of the other areas of the enchanted self that you can look for. One is positive fingerprints of your mind. Now, what's a positive fingerprint of your mind? It is something you remember. You, if you have the kind of memory where you actually see things, um, it could be your first grade classroom and you're looking at it in your mind. Some people don't really look at things, but they hear it or they feel it. So it is going back to actual things and smells and places and, and people's opinions that you heard somewhere or saw. They're part of you. And when they show up, they may mean something. They may have meaning. Maybe they mean you should call your grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe they mean that you just need a nice piece of lime. Um, what do they call that cake in Florida? Lime pie. I think I'm missing a word. But anyway, lime you know, pie. yeah, or or cheesecake or something. You deserve it. You know that kind of thing. So positive fingerprints of the mind are good conscious memories of actual happenings or mental imaginations you've had before. Positive fingerprints of the body are enhanced memories that lie within your body. Like when we've done workshops uh, with, and most of these I did with Doreen Leopard and Addison, who you've met. One woman said how her father would make her sweep the garage. But what he didn't realize is that the motion of sweeping the garage really was almost for her like a dance. She just loved yeah. doing it. it. It was great. You know, he couldn't have asked a better thing. And then I had a friend who had, uh, at the time, six young children. You can only imagine how exhausted she was. But she loved to dance up, to jump on the trampoline in the backyard. To her, it was so it was an enhanced memory somehow from being younger that really worked for her. So we have positive fingerprints of the body, just as of the mind. And um, part of the enchanted self is getting in touch with these feelings and thoughts and memories so they don't just escape and hide in the closet, you know, because otherwise, they're not very useful. These, these things can be extremely useful. They can make a rainy day not depressive. They can make uh, you um, feel uplifted when you didn't expect to. And um, they can help you really stay stable so that we don't sink into constantly moroseness. Because the truth is, we've all suffered. Yes. And focusing on the suffering, you know, may have a time and place at some point in therapy or when someone's died, but it's not the main focus that I think we should live our lives by. I think reaching toward joy and the song of the soul. Okay, so what's the song of the soul before we leave these couple of first pages. The song of the soul is not just an accidental smell of fresh leaves that puts you in a good mood or um, getting in touch with um, calling Aunt Jane on the phone and feeling the relief that you got in touch. All fine. The song of the soul is what you were talking about, Hercules, that the one 
major particular reason focus of your particular life that you know is so outstanding that it allowed the greek philosophers to talk and move away from the concept of balance so that the sense that we have a purpose and a direction and things we're offering the world that are unique make it okay if things may be tempted mm -hmm. for a little while it's okay because you're coming through and that essence of you into the universe is the most important thing you're ever going to establish about yourself i i i believe in that uh, very uh, powerfully and uh um, after a lifetime of living and living in several different ways, you know, to test the reality of ways to be and ways to live. Uh, I believe that more strongly that uh, each of us is something or someone special. And we have something unique to bring to the world. It could be a perspective. It could be a talent. It could be a way of uh, uh, processing things. But we all have that unique gift. And uh, if we explore it and then dedicate it to the betterment of life uh, or to community service or to our society or to our group, whatever you want to dedicate it to something higher than yourself, that's the highest purpose uh, that I can see in, in life, to, to find that divine quality within and to use it to light the world and to help other people find it uh, so that they can light the world as well that's that's the most exciting thing i think about doing definitely definitely and i do believe that in uh my case um my parents made it very easy for me i was really lucky but not a perfect home. They had a lot of fighting when they were young. You know, they were doing their own thing uh, as a couple. But in terms of some of the major messages that I got, um, I think those messages were so important. Um, and I think I was uh, one of, well, I'll just tell you a couple of the messages. I think one of the messages was that they, kind of saw me as as really not only their little kid but I was like the third part of a I don't know like a system or something and um when my father had time and he oftentimes in the old days he'd come home for lunch if his if he could um we would play Chinese checkers and um a card game that now has slipped from my mind, but it was it was a little more complex than um, Old Maid, but it was certainly something a four-year-old who knew how to count up to 20 could grasp. And we would play these games and I felt like, you know, I was like, just like them. You know, it was like, there was no distinction during this game playing, I was never put down like as a baby. You know, I knew the numbers and I could add enough for this simple game. And I knew how to play checker, Chinese checkers. And um, I think that gave me a great sense of empowerment that they didn't use it to tease me. They didn't tickle me to just be funny. They didn't come up with some joke out of something I spilled my milk last night. You know, so even if I was a completely normal four-year-old who cried last night over something, that's not the way this time was used. And I think that really helped me. Yes, I that, that would be very helpful. And um, the, the uh, other thing that they did was that, well, my, it was a little different from my father and my mother. My mother gave me the feeling, you know, that tomorrow's another day and um, things can always get better. She was pretty good at that. So that was very helpful. And she was, she also had a lovely, lovely way of being quite silly without being ridiculous. <laughs> So if my father went into a, we only had one car, and if my father uh, had 
taken us and he had to go to a meeting. I remember this, I was probably about six or seven. So he parked the car and he went into the meeting and my mother and I were left in the car. And like as soon as the he was out of sight, she already was ready with what we were going to do. And what we were going to do was figure out what we would do if we had a million dollars. You know, <laughs> that was it, you know. And um, okay, so that took 20 or 30 morning minutes. Or she would come home from the with the paint from the paint store and give me 30 little different colors to play with. You know, she was really good at tiny things taking on a, a kind of drapery, a, tented, a, a, a suddenness of belonging in one's life, so to speak. Good at, it, at, that, at that. That's a great talent and that's a, that's a great uh, thing to be doing because uh, uh, it frees your mind from the limitations that uh, you acquire by living it daily and with the type of beliefs that create the life that you're living, when all of a sudden, what if I could do anything? What if I had a million dollars? So now it would probably be a billion dollars. You know, yes. what, what would I do? And it, it breaks the small thinking and it opens you up to new things. And uh, that's a marvelous thing for her to have you doing. Plus, I've always believed that creativity is our most uh, divine attribute because we're taking something fuzzy and using our mind and our hands and our creativity and our in our unique perception, we're creating something real here. So her giving you those uh, the paints and things like that, 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 what a marvelous thing to do. Yeah, she was really good at that. And I'm thinking now we were going to talk about the fourth gateway, which is the gateway of pleasure and joy which we have a little bit in, in what I've been going over in the preface to my book, The Enchanted Self. Um, but we were also gonna slide into the fifth gateway. And the fifth gateway is, um, just looking for the name I actually gave it. Um, and it is, um, hold on, coming home or going away finding tribes in which to belong. Now, that's really important. And why is it? Because we really are animals, literally, and we need so much to belong. All animals, no matter what level, from a giant elephant, you know, to a very small rabbit, um, all animals by instinct need to belong to survive. And I don't think we're very different. No. I think the pandemic has really touched and hindered a lot of us in many ways. I feel for myself that I lost some of the harmony of belonging because I became very frightened. And ironically, I never got the COVID till the third year had passed. Thank God um, I'm better. My husband and I are better now um but it it did frighten me i was one of those people that didn't take it that easily and i didn't go i haven't been to a public movie in three and a half years you know when i still wear a mask when i'm food shop um yeah it 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 interrupted certain minor friendships i had but minor friendships are important yes they are you know, and if you get to talk to enough people during the day, even if it's just 30 seconds here and a minute and a half there and, you know, a phone call of three minutes later in the afternoon, it'll keep you sane and it'll help your mental health. So uh, becoming close again to people in healthy ways really, really is even more essential than I realized when I put it in as the fifth gateway. And I'm still struggling with that. Um, what I did today was, I, I, uh, just to give you an example, um, I'm having knee surgery, I hope, in a few weeks. So my knee hurts when I walk. Sorry. You know, and, um, I had a doctor's appointment and then I could have just come home, 
and I forced myself not to. Um, I returned a library book. I did a couple of other errands. Um, and I'm glad I did, even though I was in quite a bit of pain by the time I got home, I felt that I had, uh, I hadn't ditched the world. You know, I talked to a few people. I did a, you know, again, I'm pushing myself because it was very easy to stay home for those three years. And myself, as well as most psychologists, we worked on the telephone or Zoom. Um, even if you went to your office, you didn't have the ins and outs of the clients, you mm -hmm. know, because you would deal with them sitting down with a telephone or a Zoom. So the fifth, this fifth gateway, I think we're going to struggle with for years. And I think our children lost a lot of time. I was at the beach club, not this summer, but the last summer. And there was this adorable little boy and we were talking to the parents and we kind of sort of knew. And they said, don't be upset. He's probably going to start to cry when he looks at you. And I thought, well, for a normal kid of about 12 months, that's kind of unusual, you mm -hmm. know, unless you look mean or you put on a mask or something. And she said, what happened is he saw so few people in his first year of life, except us and the grandparents. He's scared of people. And, um, you know, he's not the only kid that lost time in dealing with reading people's faces and stuff. That's just one example of some of the loss that's happened for kids. Yeah, we, we seem in our lifetime is, uh, also to have experienced things the generations before, like a pandemic. Uh, that's We learned it from history. Now we experienced it. We had an attack on uh, New York uh, to rival like you know Pearl Harbor, the uh, mm -hmm. generation uh, before ours. Uh, and uh, we also had difficult uh, economic conditions that were very much like the Depression uh, with the housing crisis and... Uh, mm -hmm. Um, with the banks. Uh, so it, it seems that some type of things are, are generational and some type of things seem to be part of the human condition. And, and again, reading ancient Athenian and other literature, uh, these things have happened in the past, not exactly the way we experience them, uh, but similar things to what we experience have happened. So uh, each of these disasters, each of these uh, extreme events molds the humanity that it uh, touches and it influences how we live and uh, um, how we interact and uh, uh, what we do. So it, it seems that this is ours, but uh, we were fortunate not to have these things when we were children. That's true. That's true. Although I'm old enough that we had the polio scare. And I do remember, uh, I don't actually remember day to day, but I know one summer we weren't allowed to go to the beach, you know. So, um, but thinking about this um, joining of the right groups, um, I'll tell you just briefly one of the stories that I wrote to give people a hint of how they can look at themselves. Um, a client of mine had a, a very difficult child and she was handling this kid very well. And, um, but she was tired. So her girlfriend asked her if she wanted to go with a few other ladies, they were going to take a trip along the um, New England coastline, you know, stay at motels at night, just have a good time for a few days. So of course she mentioned it to her husband because we live in a, uh, still in a society where oftentimes getting the, the permission or the release of the husband is relevant. That's a whole nother discussion. But anyway, and of course he said, how can you possibly go? You know, we have X kid and you've got to do all these extra things for X kid and don't think I'm doing them. You know, if you go away four days and um, I don't know, I don't think you should go. Well, that did it course she went you know that's all she needed was 
his push to get out of the house. And of course, she had a wonderful time. And the thing about this was this was a temporary group, four days, still friends, but the group itself, driving, eating, sleeping in motel rooms was only four days. And what that shows is you can have a lot of richness in being willing to join temporary groups. Mm -hmm. You don't have to all be perfect and, and forever. So I give a little homework in this fifth, um, this fifth gateway, and I suggest try making a list of all the groups you currently belong to. Now divide that group into those you're happy with, those you're not. And over the next month or so, take time to brainstorm with yourself in terms of these groups. One is, can you bring more pleasure and happiness into your life by expanding your connection already within the group? This is often true, for example, like with a church or a synagogue. You know, you go randomly, but is there a study group? Is there a group helping the public with a food bank? Is there something more you can do and still be part of that group? Or do you really need to drop a group? You know, you've been paying dues somewhere and it's just, it's nothing. It's just nothing. The couple of people you like the most moved away and whatever. So try to clean some of these things up over the next month. and. Um, that'll be a good step. It'll be a good step in helping you recognize the advantages. Again, I think even of coming out of the pandemic of what we can uh, gather from regroup, regrouping our groups if we need to. That's very timely uh, advice so you're giving in those exercises. I, I belong to a lot of uh, service organizations or, or several of them that are very well known. And uh, lately, too, I've been asking myself, you know, they're great people, um, but th the purpose that I had when I joined the organizations doesn't seem to be there, or the organization changed focus, and I'm not really into the things that they're focusing on now. Um, so I, I've been slowly withdrawing from some of them. For instance, I was uh, the president of the Friends of one of the local libraries, and uh, that was a lot of work. Um, but I didn't mind putting it in uh, because uh, they had certain things that I believe were important that they're working towards. And I wanted to give time and energy towards the actualization of those things. And then the administration in the library changed. And there were still good people doing important things, but the things that they were focusing on weren't things that filled me with excitement and energy. So I stayed because uh, with the pandemic, um, they needed somebody to uh, bring checks to the bank and pay bills and things like that. So I did it because it was needed. And I felt uh, that, you know, I, I couldn't just leave something when it was in need, you know, and uh, I, I could do something about uh, the group because I felt very strongly about the group uh, uh, before. Uh, so once it started getting new members again, I didn't run for president anymore. And I let go of it. And again, they're great people doing great things, but they weren't the things that gave me joy, uh, that gave my time and energy uh, meaning. And uh, I do a lot of uh, public uh, speaking also. So because of the pandemic, that got very disrupted. Like places where I regularly spoke, uh, there was no speaking. Uh, and I didn't want to do it on Zoom, uh, although I, I do the shows on Zoom. And uh, I found that a lot of the people that were in my groups had become my friends. And now we had them over the house for like a meeting uh, to decide what to do. And we found that just having them over the house and interacting with them was fine. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't need to be talking about anything profound or thought provoking or, um, you know, to have a, a topic. Uh, so we all decided that although I would still do that because th th that's what they liked my doing. Um, the, one of the times, like every three meetings, we would just have a social where we wouldn't 
uh, talk about anything or explore anything. We would just enjoy each other and catch yeah. up with each other. So we did that uh, last month. And now this month I have a topic. But uh, last month we just sat around drinking coffee, eating fruit or dessert, yes. talking, getting to know each other better. And it was very stimulating and it was very wonderful. So that, that new group came into being because of the pandemic, because it was, it was a bunch of little scattered groups and they all kind of melded together and and became friends, became a, a new tribe. Yeah. Well, we did a similar thing that was very, I'll uh, just mention, and uh, actually we're still doing it. And that is that many people um, who are Jewish, you know, take some time with the Sabbath, whether they take an hour or they're very committed to take a whole day, that's up, up for grabs. But it's a nice feeling to have some feeling that it's the end of the week, you know, and this type of thing. And so um, about 12 of us started to get on Zoom together on, on Friday evenings. And um, sometimes we discuss something that has a religiosity flavor to it. Perhaps it's a particular section of the Bible. But it's not a necessity. Sometimes we go back into our childhoods and we reminisce or we tell jokes or we, you know, just sometimes we, someone needs advice. So it becomes, a, it's just become a, a, a nice feeling, almost like when I can imagine in another uh, time of life when uh, people had porches and uh, all the six months that were not warm enough, everybody sort of ended up on Rose's porch for a while in the early evening, you know, that kind of thing. So yes, yeah. So things, there have been a lot of good things too. Well, I think that as far as um, the Enchant itself, we've got two more gateways that are formally in the seven gateways that we now have dulled out so no one can see it carefully. There's the seven put, gateways. I will put that on our okay. um, image on uh, YouTube so people yeah. can see it. And we have this one on, I think, the, the Enchant itself, right? The image. I've, I've used that one as well. So Yeah. yeah. So anyway, I hope you um, got something out of the Enchant itself tonight and look for or recognize now fingerprints of your mind when they pop in and fingerprints of your body. I think you'll find it very intriguing and, and see there are so many special little things that make your day in a positive way. Oh, th this was important. In fact, I, I'm enjoying our conversations uh, so much that I've been putting them in uh, uh, my stigma free group and my mayor's wellness campaign group and in my community wellness uh, uh, group because uh, uh, these are questions, these are issues, these are ways of looking at life that do uh, enhance and enrich one's uh, experience. So again, instead of focusing on the, the problems, uh, and we and again, problems do happen. That's a reality. You know, there are challenges and, uh, you know, not everything is as we want it to be. Uh, but focusing on doing something positive with yourself, your true self, rather than just uh, making more money, being more successful, at, you know, uh, whatever thing you feel you need to be successful at, and then measuring yourself against other people, just uh, taking the time to look at inside yourself and look outside yourself into your life and to extract meaning and joy from those things, uh, that is a wonderful gift. And uh, I appreciate your sharing that gift with me and with uh um, the people in my community. So this gets posted in there as soon as it posts on uh, YouTube. Oh, that's great. Uh, that is excellent. I'm excited to hear that. Yeah. Well, I enjoy tonight as I always do. And uh, anyone who wants to write to me, as I've said before, the only people I don't answer is if they sound a little like they're maybe not safe to answer. Otherwise, I answer. And feel free to write to me at barbara.holstein at gmail.com. And my major site is enchantedself.com. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, as always, you're awesome. 
and I look forward to our next uh, conversation. Thanks also to our wonderful audience who's watching this on YouTube. Um, I'm going to start letting people know that if they like what we're doing, to check like, uh, to comment, and to subscribe. And this way we can expand what we're doing and do uh, more of it. Great. Uh, until next time, thanks again, Barbara. Joyous journeys and amazing adventures, everyone. Take care. Good night. Good night.